take this opportunity to welcome you tonight to this series of uh, lectures put together by the Committee on Lectures. <coughs> tonight, we would like to feed you with food for your brains, food for your soul, and food for your muscles. Let me take this opportunity to thank you for coming out tonight, taking time off your studies, and some of us taking time off your sleep, because some of us are sleeping by this time. Uh, thank you for being here with us tonight. Uh, tonight's uh, discussion, or tonight's lecture, will focus on the Africans worldwide, as the Africans in the motherland and the Africans in the diaspora, according to the academicians. Uh, let me start by making one important announcement. Uh, I, mentioned, uh, I alluded to the fact that you'll have food for your muscles too. Uh, we will have a concert after this lecture tonight. Supposedly it should be at 9.30. The world citizens will give us food for our muscles tonight. That's a band based in Minneapolis. Uh, they opened for the world famed Whalers. So after that, then we'll be treated to the music. Before I waste any of uh, the speaker's time or any of your time, let me hand you over to Brother Michael Bolden, who will introduce the speaker. Thank you. Good evening. All right. uh, <laughs> I don't need a microphone. I got a big enough mouth. So, um, but. Again, I get the opportunity to introduce to you a speaker. Seems like um, most times when I introduce somebody, I get this long vita, about 10 or 15 pages long, and I'm supposed to condense that into a few opening words. Then you kind of examine it, who's speaking, and you say, well, they have all this information about them, but what is he really doing? And uh, you come to the to realization that not, not a whole lot. Then I get the opportunity to introduce Brother Imani, and I'm handed one sheet of paper. And from that, you can infer that he's doing a whole lot. Because the more they talk about you, the less they're doing. So uh, I'm going to be brief. I'd like to just give you a little brief background information on Brother Imani. We know his true home is, of course, Africa, because he's of African descent. But he grew up in St. Louis. He went to high school in St. Louis. From there, he went on to Southern University, where he received a Juris Doctorate. That means he's a lawyer. He knows the law. And now you know that's something black folks need, is people who know the law. From there on, he, went, he, he fed his mind, he fed his body. He searched out people who thought like him. And he began to organize student government, national student government. Then he went on to be a member of the All African People's Revolutionary Party, based in Guinea-Bissau, Africa. And that's the way he comes to you from today. Ladies and gentlemen, Brothers and sisters, I present to you my brother, my friend, my comrade, Imani Now Emoji. Good evening. How are you? We bid, we, get, we bid all of you a good night, and we thank you very, very much for coming out tonight. It's kind of cold out there. Matter of fact, when I was coming in here, I thought it was going to be a little bit warmer, and I grabbed my jacket, and I still went out, I'm still out there freezing. But y'all probably used to it. Are y'all used to this weather? No. <laughs> <laughs> One day it's real, real hot, the next day it's real, real cold. Very seriously, we want to give our most uh, warm-hearted thanks to the organizers here at this university. Let, this morning we were meeting some students, and uh, Brother Jake introduced me to a student. He said, this is the brothers come here to do the speech, and da 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 And I said, no, you are the one who's doing the organizing. You're the one who knows the terrain here. You're the one who has to deal with the students' dials and the one questions every single day. I came in yesterday. I'm leaving out tomorrow. I just get to come in here and say a few words. And what I hope to be able to do is just do that. Say a few words. I would like to use a little bit of the chalkboard and hope that maybe you take a few notes. We're all students. I think most of us are students, or at least have been students. And then we'd like to leave a block of time open for questions and answers. And we consider that part to be the most important part. Because none of us can come here and say we have a monopoly on information. 
Each of us have different levels of development. Emil Cabral, the brother who pictures right here, is a great man in Africa, Emil Cabral. He said that those of us who know must teach those of us who don't know. Those of us who know must teach those of us who don't know. And those of us who don't know must listen to those who know. So that in the rest of our life, we will all be students. At the same time, we'll be teachers. I was a student for 21 years. I'm a teacher of English, but I'm more so a student of life than anything else. Before we move on, we would like for, uh, if you can understand something very important today, September the 18th is the anniversary of the birthday of one of Africa's greatest sons. If I were to say January 15th, I wouldn't have to say the name Martin Luther King. Automatically, if, I, if it was January 15th, I'd say today is a very important day. Automatically, you would know it's Martin Luther King's birthday. Kwame Nkrumah. Let me write his name on the board. Kwame Nkrumah, a name who we should know. This is his picture. And this is his picture. Kwame Nkrumah is one of the greatest sons of Africa. Why so? Kwame Nkrumah, who was born in Africa, September in Ghana, in uh, Kumasi, Ghana, on September the 18th, 1909, lived a life that reflects what we call a pan-African perspective. That is to say, when we say pan-Africanism, we say there's an objective. That pan-Africanism means all of Africa is free, all of Africa is unified, and all of Africa is socialist. That's an objective. But we come to use pan-African sometimes as an adjective. It could mean, for example, we could say a pan-African mix. For example, the fact that Brother A.B. was born in Azania, South Africa. He's an African. Me, I was unfortunately born in America, in St. Louis, Missouri. I'm an African. We have with us, I think, some brothers and sisters. Brother Jake was born in Ghana, in Africa. Just last week, I had the pleasure and the privilege of being with a beautiful African sister who was born and lives, unfortunately, in England, outside of Africa. But she is an African. When you put us together, we talk about a pan-African mix. My sister over here, born in the Bahamas, is an African. All people of African descent are African. Kwame Nkrumah came to manifest with his life an experience in the brief period of one person's life, a great example of a person living a pan-African life, born in Africa, comes to America to study because imperialism had ravaged Africa so bad that we had very few universities during the time of colonialism. Kwame Nkrumah comes to America, to Lincoln University, where he graduates, getting his degree in sociology, theology, and psychology, goes on from there, learning the experience of African people in America being victimized by American racism, goes from there to London, England, to help organize the Fifth Pan-African Conference, Congress, excuse me, Fifth Pan-African Congress, along with great people such as W.E.B. Du Bois, another great Pan-Africanist, born in the United Snakes of America, grew up inside the racist United Snakes of America, leaves here, travels the whole world, goes to Ghana at the age of 90 years old, W.E.B. Du Bois, founder of the NAACP, W.E.B. Du Bois, the same man who wrote Souls of Black Folks. Have you all read that book? In that book, remember, he said, I'm having a struggle inside of me. Part of my spirit is African. That's where my ancestors are from. Yet I was born in America, the offspring of slaves. I have this ongoing struggle. Which part of me? Which do I go? America, Africa. By the time he reached 90 years old, he resolved that contradiction. Moved home to Africa at 90 years of age. Began working with the government of Kwame Nkrumah in Ghana, free Ghana, liberated Ghana, working on a lifetime uh, project called Encyclopedia Africana. You've heard of Encyclopedia Britannica, Encyclopedia Americana. <laughs> he was working on Encyclopedia Africana. He literally wrote himself to death in Africa at the age of 95. He called a press conference, took his American passport, called an international press conference, and said that the black man, the African, would be a fool to stay in America, burnt his passport. <laughs> he resolved his contradiction. He died in Africa, and in Ghana, if you go to Ghana to this very day, you will see a monument dedicated to W.E.B. Du Bois, the W.E.B. Du Bois Pan-African Learning Center. There you will see great photos of great Pan-Africanists, such as Malcolm X, Kwame Nkrumah, Martin Luther King. Kwame Nkrumah came to, liberate, came to lead the struggle that liberated Ghana in 1957, March the 6th, 1957. He was so anxious for this day, this celebration, where you would probably think if you had been involved in all the struggles that Kwame Nkrumah was involved in to liberate a nation, you would think that when the day of celebration came, that he would say, OK, the struggle's over. We reached our victory. Not Kwame Nkrumah. On that very day, matter of fact, they began their celebration five minutes to midnight, March the 5th, to make sure that they didn't start one second late. 
On March the 6th, midnight, 12 hours, well, zero hours, actually, he said, the independence of Ghana is meaningless unless it's linked to the total liberation and unification of Africa under one African people's socialist government. Kwame Nkrumah said that the independence of Ghana means nothing unless all of Africa is liberated and socialist. Therefore, we will dedicate every ounce of our strength, every little square micro inch of Ghana for the total liberation of Africa. Kwame Nkrumah, one of Africa's greatest sons. We come to speak about our ancestors. For example, many times when we begin our programs, we give tributes to our ancestors. Many times, the first thing that comes to our mind, we think of ancestors, somebody who lived thousands of years ago, maybe in some desert off in the sand somewhere next to some rock and died right there. Or we think about somebody thousands of years. But ancestors, everybody who came before us, both good and bad. We come to honor Kwame Nkrumah. He's the example of one of our greatest ancestors. He died April the 27th, 1972. One day, each and every one of us in this room will be the ancestor to the future generations yet to come. The question is, when your grandchildren's grandchildren look back on you, will they say that you were a great ancestor, somebody who should be honored like a Kwame Nkrumah, or will they say that you were a pitiful example of a human being, somebody like a Clarence Thomas, for example? <laughs> what will they say? When you live your life, when it's finished, it's finished. But your spirit lives on. All the time we say the spirit of Martin Luther King lives on. The spirit of Emil Kakabra lives on. The spirit of Kwame Nkrumah lives on. We know their bodies are dead, but their souls live on. So what you do with your life, it has eternal impact. What you don't do with your life has eternal impact. Where you are is very important, and what you do and, and the knowledge of who you are is very important. We are in Iowa, Ames, Iowa. Iowa is in the United Snakes of America. America is the western part of the Western Hemisphere. Every square inch of the Western Hemisphere has this indigenous population which are still alive to this very day, people we call American Indians. We call them American Indians because Columbus was so lost. When he, got, he thought he was an Indian, he came here. They found him. He said, oh, y'all must be Indians because I thought I was an Indian, which means if he thought he was in China, we would think they're Chinese to this day. American Chinese is what, probably what we'd be calling them. We must not only give honor to American Indians, people we call American Indians, the indigenous population. It's not enough to stand here before, oh, we give great honor to the American Indians. If you love someone, if you have trust in someone, and that someone is oppressed, if you really love that someone, you must do any and everything unconditionally to help the advancement of that someone who you love. <laughs> American Indians, the indigenous peoples of this land, have a great history have a great civilization that continues on to today. I know a lot of times we think about cowboy and Indian movies and we think that the Indians were savages and the cowboys were good and they shot it up and they had the shootouts and bang, 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 shoot them dead, it's finished. No, American Indians like any people resist oppression to this very day. If you work on the side of American Indians, you work on the side of humanity. American Indians are human beings, like Palestinians, like Africans, like Asians, like all peoples, they're human beings. And all peoples who are oppressed will rise up against the oppressor. For example, if I come into this room with a gun, I say, close the doors, you all are my captives. What's going to be the first thing on your mind? What will be in the forefront of your thinking? To free yourself from this captivity. If I keep you here for a week, for the rest of this week, what will you be thinking about? You might think about the television programs you're missing. You might think about the test that you got tomorrow that you're missing. But what will be in the forefront? What will be the primary thing that you will think about? Freedom. What is the primary motivating force, the primary motivating thought of any oppressed person? Freedom. Sure, you think about using the bathroom, you think about eating, but what is the primary motivating force in the forefront of all of our minds, those of us who are oppressed? It's freedom. And the American Indians are still struggling to this day. This land that we are on is their land. It is not the land of Europeans. It is not the land of Africans. There are parts of this land you can walk down the street, and you can see nothing but Europeans and think that you're in Paris or London or Italy or somewhere like that. But are you in Europe? You're in America. And America belongs to the peoples who we call Chicanos, 
the people who we call Mexicans, the people who we call Eskimos, the people who we call so many different things. Those people, those people who look like American Indians that you see down in Nicaragua, El Salvador, in Haiti, in Peru, in Bolivia, in Canada, right here in Iowa, are the owners of this land. All of us Africans, Europeans, are foreigners. If you're walking down the street in Azania, South Africa, in Johannesburg, in Azania, South Africa, in Johannesburg, and you saw nothing but Europeans. You know that happens in the Johannesburg. There are parts of Johannesburg where you see nothing but Europeans. Big skyscrapers, big streets, fancy cars, computers, all of this. You can become confused and think again that you're in Europe. But where are you? In Africa. If you are in Jerusalem, Palestine, what they call Israel, occupied Palestine. You can walk down the street and see nothing but Europeans. And again, you can think you're in Europe. But where are you? In Palestine. Palestine belongs to Palestinians. Africa belongs to Africans. America belongs to the peoples who we call American Indian, the indigenous population of this land. And just like Palestinians will get their land back, and they're proving it every day, just like Africans will get our land back and we're proving it every day, American Indians, the indigenous peoples of this population, will get their land back. The only question is, what role will we play? They are natural allies. During the time of slavery, when our great-grandparents were running away from the slave plantation, it was the Indian reservations that took us in. Even up to this day, you can find Indians such as Seminole Indians in Florida who are darker than many Africans you run into. Because uh, uh, Indians are very collective, egalitarian, humanist peoples who had a great high civilization, high level of educating their young, didn't tell lies. Matter of fact, I know it's difficult to understand. If you think about all the treaties that were signed between the Europeans, the terrorists who came here to those who came to take the land from the American Indians, it was 365, if I'm not mistaken. The Europeans wrote down every last one. They wrote down every last one. The American Indians didn't write down any. But the Europeans who wrote down every last one, they broke every last one, except one. They promised to take the land, and they took it. <coughs> so we come to struggle. All of us, all peoples, we are all equal in essence. We have different forms. Some of us are tall, some of us are short, some of us are fat, some of us are skinny, some of us are dark, some of us are light, some of us come from European descent, some come from African descent, some come from this land, some come from Asia, but all of us are equal in essence. The only difference is the form. The only difference is the form. We have many struggles that are similar. Africans, American Indians, Palestinians. America is occupied by what is called settler colonialism. Settler colonialism is one group of people leave the la the, their land of origin, they go to another land, take it over. For example, Europeans who came to Azania, South Africa, they came to take it over. They took over Zimbabwe, they took over what we call South Africa, Azania, South Africa. To this very day, you still see them there. They set up, settled there, settler colonialism. Same thing happened inside of Palestine. They settled there. The same thing happened inside of America. They settled here. If we don't do anything to help American Indians, we are just as guilty of their oppression as those who perpetrated it on them. Just like if a brother, come, a brother if a person, a man, a, a human being who's a male comes to try to rape you, and I don't do anything to help you, I sit there and say, that's not my business, I don't have nothing to do with that one. I didn't perpetrate the rape on you, but I'm just as guilty as the rapist because I didn't do anything to stop him. Inaction is an action. You learn that physics, every action has a reaction. Inaction is an action. And whenever a person is inactive in the confront, when we confront injustice, we are just as guilty of the injustice as the perpetrator of injustice itself. The other day I was listening to a man, an old man. He was telling my father, he said, oh man, times are really bad. Times are really bad. I just don't know what I'm going to do. Times are just really bad. I keep hearing people saying this over and over again. Times are really bad. He said, I hope that my grandchildren don't have to see it like this. I didn't tell him, but in my mind, I'm saying, you know, you, at times it's going to be bad until you make them good. <laughs> you can sit back all you want and wish for something, but until you become actively involved in the struggle to make the wrong a right, it will continue to be a wrong. Martin Luther King used to say, injustice only exists to the extent that per persons of goodwill do nothing. That's to say the injustice that we see in this land and around the world will continue until those of us who are concerned do something. And we have to do more than think. You know, you can think anything you want to think, but what is reality is different. I can think I'm a woman, but am I a woman? 
You can think you're a man, but are you a man? No. What is, is. What you think is something else. We have to become involved in our struggle. How can we find the, the, the solution to our people's problems? We have to look at the origins of the problem. If you were sick and I were a doctor and you come to see me, I don't, and you say I have a runny nose, I got a headache, I got a stomach ache, I don't just give you some Pepto-Bismol for your stomach, some aspirin for your headache, and then a, some uh, Kleenex for your nose. I must come to discover what is the root, what is the virus, what is the root of your problem. And then when I discover what the root of the problem is, then I can cure the disease rather than just treat it. The same thing is true with human beings. You know, too often at these universities, we study the hard sciences, which are good, like physics, like mathematics, like history, etc., biology, chemistry. But what we don't do enough of is studying the sciences of human beings. And human beings are the most important thing on the earth. We know about physics, we know about mathematics, but we don't understand enough about human beings. So to discover the roots of our problem, we have to look at history. Malcolm X said that out of all of our studies, history is most prepared to reward our investigations. That is to say, out of all the work we can do, what is most qualified to reward our research, to reward our work, is history. Kwame Nkrumah came to say that this history is a pointer up of the ideology of a people. <coughs> That is to say, every people, every society has ideology. Ideology determines what you do. Ideology determines your life. For example, when people leave one land to go fight in a war, it's because of an ideology. When a young boy or a young girl leaves her family to go fight a war somewhere else, it's because of an ideology to direct her in that direction. And Krumah came to say that history is the pointer up of this ideology. Let me just show you very quickly on this board the relationship between history <coughs> Culture, ideology, and freedom. Any people who are not free should be concerned more so than anything else with their freedom. History, culture, ideology, and freedom. This is the outline for tonight. History, what is the definition? Anybody a history major here? Can anybody tell me the definition of history? All right, I'll tell you. I'll give you a quick, easy one. You can write this one down. Use this in your class. History is nothing but past politics. History is nothing other than past politics. Everything that happened yesterday was political. It's now history today. Everything political that happens today in politics is not just limited to what you see on CNN, like what goes on in Washington, D.C. Politics. Any political science majors here? What are y'all majoring in? <laughs> what is the definition of politics, my brother? Who gets what, when, why? I like that definition. <laughs> <laughs> Who gets what, when, where? You can say why, too, but how is usually the most important, or how much, really. <laughs> so, you see, the, you see the relationship very quickly, just in terms of outline. You know, history is something, that, you know, people major in history. They go to their classes every day. They have all these classes, all these books, all this homework, and they still don't learn that much about history. Same thing with politics. I was a major, I was a student of political science, and I learned more outside of the classroom about politics than I did inside of the classroom. Classroom sometimes very limited. Sometimes they have teachers who don't know anything about what they're talking about, and they're going to still, still, <laughs> still make you go to class every day. If history is past politics, and politics determines who gets what, when they get it, where they get it, and sometimes why they get it, how much they get, how they get it, etc., then everything that happens, everything is political. The water you drink is political. Some people don't have water. Do you know there are places in Africa to this very day where people don't have water to drink, and Africa has the largest supply of water in the whole wide world? 50% of the world's water power is in Africa. You know how much it's being used to this day because of colonialism, because of imperialism? 1%. Africa has the capability of feeding the whole wide world. Ethiopia alone can feed the whole continent, and people are starving. Why is that? It's, histor it's historical. It's political. Politics determines who, what, when, where, why, and how. It's everything. Everything's political. If you, ask some, if you talk to somebody about politics, they say, I don't want to talk about politics. I don't like nothing about no politics. That's a political response. 
It's a politically ignorant response, but it's a political response. Everything is, po is political. It's just that sometimes we become confused and we think politics is limited to electoral bourgeois politics. So do we think that in a, in a bourgeois society, you understand bourgeois? <laughs> A society where you got those few elites who don't care about anything else other than themselves and they will trample on people, human beings, just so they become richer. Elites bourgeois in one society like the United Snakes of America have more in common with the bourgeois in China or the bourgeois in, in France than they do with the population in this country. Bourgeois, the enemies of humanity, bourgeoisie. <laughs> His, but politics can be good or bad, like a gun. If a burglar comes in here with a gun right now, a robber, a villain comes in with a gun right now, that gun is negative. But if that, if that same villain comes to hold all of us in captivity and you, you run and you get another gun and you free us, the gun you use is a good gun. Like religion. Religion, when in the hands of the oppressor, can come to oppress us. They can tell you, don't fight for your freedom like they did us here in this land and all, and in the 62 countries around the world. They used to tell us on the slave plantation, they say, look, God said that the best thing you could do is be a slave and you'll be a good slave and when you die, you go to glory and then you'll see have a good life, you know, lands flowing with milk and honey. That religion, in that hand of the oppressor, is a bad religion. But this same religion will put it in the hands of good peoples like a Harriet Tubman or a Nat Turner or a Demar Vizi. They come to use this religion like a Martin Luther King or like a Seiko Toure. They come to use the religion to liberate the people. That religion is a good religion. Politics is the same way. When in the hands of the masses of the people who are well informed, who have what we call political education, we can come to use politics and we will to free our people and we will come to see that politics is more important than economics and that politics di dictate economics. Matter of fact, what do you think this what is? Who gets what? It's economics. Whether you talk about gold, diamond, etc., it's the what. So then, not only is politics and religion similar that you're in the hands of the enemy, it comes to oppress us. In the hands of us, it comes to liberate us. The same thing is true with history. Those people who begin history of Africa was when Europeans discovered Africa, as though we had no history before they came, are using history to demobilize us, to oppress us. The same thing is true in the diaspora outside of Africa. They began history in this country in 1619. Like nothing was going on in this country before 1619. Like we didn't, I, I was having a struggle with my father the other day. We were talking about an ancestor. He said, you know, I don't know about all this African stuff you're going to. You're changing your name, got an African name. It's like you disown the family. I said, no, that's not the correct way to look at it. The correct way to look at it is that during the time of slavery, the slave master imposed a European name on African people Y'all saw Roots, remember when they were beating Kunta Kinte? Your name is Toby. Bop! He said, no, Kunta. Toby. Bop! They, fought, they imposed these names on us. They tried to impose every single aspect of their ideology on us to deculturalize us, to assimilate us. They thought they could take away our culture. But you know what? You can never take away people's culture. Because Culture is the sum total of a, of a people's historical experience. Culture is the sum total of a people's historical experiences. Therefore, is culture something static, or is it something that continues to evolve? It's not static, because the peoples live on. So African culture is not just the way you dress, the name you have, the hairstyle you use. Those are manifestations of it. Our culture is our history. <laughs> this history, when put in the hands of the people, will come to make our culture move forward. Let me show you how. This history, we say that when they began our history, with, when they discovered Africa, and when they discovered, and when they brought us to America as slaves, it's kind of like a map. Here you have north, south, east, west. Now, we want to get from here in the south to here in the north. If you have streets, I can give you direction. I say you go up north about three blocks, make a left turn, then you go about another two blocks, make a right turn, then you arrive at this point, etc. But what will happen if you're trying to get north? Somebody comes along, erases off the directions, cuts off part of the map, and then turns it around. They'll have you going east when you think you're going west, and have you going north when you think you're going south, have you fighting against your friends when you think you're fighting against your enemies, fighting against your enemies when you think you're fighting against your friends. That's how history works. We have a great history. 
It's more to it than just learning about individuals like a Kwame Nkrumah or Martin Luther King or Malcolm X. We must look at our, his our history from a historical and a dialectical perspective. That is to say, when we come to look at, for example, a Martin Luther King, what were the historical conditions that produced a Martin Luther King? Did he just, was he born of an immaculate conception and he said, I think that I'll be a leader of my people? Or did he come up through the ranks like us? Somebody who lived in an unjust society and just responded to the unjust society, like all peoples do. There are many, 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 many Martin Luther Kings, and there will be many more right in this very room, some of the people you go to school with. They might not get on television, get all the publicity Martin Luther King got, because during the time of the 60s, television was new in America, and those people who owned NBC, CBS, and ABC said they would never make that same mistake again. They said one of the worst mistakes they made was put Stokely Carmichael, whose name is Kwame Turi now, on television, talking about black power and talking about Zionism. They said that's the worst mistake they made, they'll never make that one again. So they won't do that. So the peoples who we're looking for to lead us are right here in this very room. Matter of fact, it's each and every one of us. There will never be a leader. I'm not a leader. Me, I'm just like you. I'm a student. I'm, a, I'm not in classes anymore, but I'm a student for life, and I'm a person who loves my people and wants to see the solution to our people's problems, which will be a great contribution to all of humanity. That's what we want, humanity. We want to advance humanity. In fact, what is the purpose of life? If it's not the advancement of humanity, what is the purpose of life? Why are they human beings? You have dogs, you have animals, you have uh, cows who can eat. So I don't think we were put here just to eat, to consume. Even animals can reproduce, have sex, reproduce, and pass on, they die. We have a, a higher calling than animals. Our calling is to advance humanity. Not to simply consume, but to advance humanity, to produce more than we consume. If we don't produce more than we consume, if we don't advance humanity, we just live an animal life, like a dog or a cat. What is the purpose of us coming to this institution, Iowa State University, or any school that we go to? What is the purpose of knowledge? <coughs> Kwame Nkrumah came to tell us that education is not just the sum total of what a man and woman knows. It's what he or she does with this education to advance humanity that's important. So if you come to Iowa State University and you cram for your test like some people are doing tonight for their test tomorrow and for their quiz tomorrow, or if you just copy like a lot of people do, I know they got all kinds of creative ways to copy, and you get your degree, your slave degree to go work for, to sell your labor for capitalism, <laughs> or your master's degree, <laughs> <laughs> or your PhD, this one brother told me it meant psychological human disorder, <laughs> then you have just wasted our time and wasted our energy. You are at this university not because you're so smart. You're at this university because people sweated, gave their lives, bled, suffered so you could have the seats that you're sitting in. The seats that you're sitting in aren't there because you were so smart you got this scholarship or because you falsified your application and you outslicked them. You're at this university because people had to seriously struggle. You know what? These, these, this, this wood and the bricks that make up this building, all of them are cemented with blood and sweat. And that's what should be your motivating uh, force when you study. You must study. Remember, A is for Africa. So now, back to this history. <laughs> history then, in a general sense, is nothing but past politics. But you know, history moves forward by the masses of the people, not by one great man or one great woman. It's by the masses. Each and every one of us have a tremendous impact on history. Even if I remove this book from here to here, I have changed the world. It might, not, it might seem insignificant. If you move one grain of sand from here to there, you have changed the world. The only question is, how significant will the change be when we come to change it? How significant will the change be when we come to change it? I want to show you, just a little briefly, what makes history move forward with these masses of people. What is the motive force of history? What makes history move forward? Anybody know? Karl Marx, who is a great man, Karl Marx who came to make a great contribution to human society, Karl Marx said that the driving force of history is the class struggle. That is to say that whenever you have oppressed peoples, they will come to rise up against those who oppress them. That's the class struggle. One class sits on it. In a class society, like a capitalist society, where you have classes, you have the haves, the have-nots, you have what is called the bourgeoisie, the petty bourgeoisie, you have the peasants, you have the workers, you have these classes. Seiko Turi came to sum it all up. He said, really, there's just two classes the people's class and the anti-people's class. In a class struggle, when the people's, those who oppress come to rise up against those who oppress them, it makes history move forward. This is what Karl Marx said. Karl Marx, a great man. Emile Karl Cabral, a great man, came to add on to that. He said, I, I agree with Karl Marx. But I think that if he were alive, he would agree that that is not enough. Because he said the class struggle is what makes history move forward. 
He said, I'm sure that Karl Marx would have to agree. Emil Karl Cabral said this. Emil Karl Cabral. Should I spell his name on the board? They do have books by him in the library. You know that place y'all be running from all the time? <laughs> Emil Karl Cabral, Kwame Nkrumah. You know what? In some of these uh, societies in the world, the people, they just really want to read. They really want to study. You know where I live in Guinea-Bissau? If I take some information and I, and I start giving it to you and I, and I don't look like I'm very gifted, they start rushing me. Give me some, give me some. Like it's food or money or something like that. I'm telling you. And that's how it is in many countries in the world. You know, little children in Africa can name you countries all over Africa, countries of the world, can tell you who was the president before Bush, who was the president before that in America, who's the president of China, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But you got many people who grew up in America, which is supposed to be one of the most highly technicalized society in the world, has uh, probably more universities than most countries in the world, but you have Students who go through all the way through the university, they can't hardly tell you nothing about the rest of the world. And they'd be arrogant about, I don't know nothing about it over there. Don't want to know nothing about it. Don't want to go over there. Emil Karkabra, please study him. He's in the library. We could spend all night talking about him. He's a great example for us. But uh, Emil Karkabra came to add on to Karl Marx's analysis. Emil Karkabra came to say, I think Karl Marx would have to agree that although it's true that the class struggle is a motive force of history, that there was a time in history when there was never classes. In Africa, for example, do you know that one time in Africa we had communal societies? This was the first economic system known to man and womankind. And in this classless society, there were no classes. Therefore, there was no class struggle. But I'm sure Karl Marx would have to agree that these peoples had history. And what we're struggling for in the world to advance humanity, we don't want one class sitting on top of another class, oppressing them. We want a, a world. Uh, free of exploitation. No man, no woman exploiting any other man or any other woman. We want a classless society. That's what we want. We want a society where everybody has, where everybody gives according to their abilities and receives according to their needs. So there will be a time in, in human history where there will be no classes. This is what we want. Even people are unconscious, they want it. They struggle for it all the time. Like, for example, I think there's probably about 100 people in this room. Let's say we had some food, all of us are hungry, we bring 100 plates of food in here, and I run out with uh, 95 of those plates of food. <laughs> would y'all go for that? No, you would struggle against me to, to distribute the, the food equal, equitably, equally, right? It's just a, a natural instinct. If it's not natural, it's definitely conditioned. Amir Cabral came to say that no, it's not just the class struggle that makes history move forward. <coughs> He came to say that it's the modes of production that makes history move forward. What are modes of production? We have these things that are called productive forces. Productive forces. Productive forces are those forces, for example, things that grow out the land. This shirt was made from cotton. Cotton grows out the land. People had to go pick the cotton, and they take the cotton, and they uh, refine it. They call it milling it, stealing it, I'm sorry, stealing the cotton. And they turn it into a thread. It comes from the land. That's a productive force. You know what the number one productive force in the world is? Human beings. Human beings. Cabral came to say that there's two ways that you could have these productive forces controlled. That determines the mode of production, how you control the productive forces. Let me show you. Y'all get this up? I get racist? Yes. Okay. Can you tell I teach school? <laughs> so you have productive forces. Number one productive force is the human being. Man and woman. All things that are produced, oil, gold, diamond, cotton, etc., all these are productive forces. There are two ways that you can control these productive forces. You can control them by a few people, or you can control them by all the people. The, this control of the productive forces is what we call the mode of production. So then, the relationship between man and woman, <coughs> and man and woman, and man and woman collectively's relationship with nature determines the mode of production. This is the motor force of history. This is what makes history move forward. So if the mode of productions are slowed up by a few individuals who come to exploit the productive forces, then history consequently is slowed up. Cabral came to teach us, as I told you a few minutes ago, that culture is not a static phenomenon. It's an evolving phenomenon. Culture is the sum total of our historical experiences. So if the mode of productions, if the productive forces are in captivity, are captivated, like during the time of slavery, 
like during the time of capitalism, like during the time of the highest phase of capitalism, imperialism, which has as its forms in the other countries of colonialism. That is to say, where you have a, a colony in Africa colonized by the English, England is the imperialist country, that country in Africa is the colony. They slow up the productive forces. They slow up the peoples, they slow up the, the productive forces, those things that are produced from the land. Then, consequently, they slow up history. Consequently, they slow up the cultural development of the peoples. Well, if you are peoples whose productive forces have been slowed up, how can you make your history move forward? How can you make your culture move forward? By resisting against those foreigners, resistance, I just put resistance, Resistance against foreign domination. Those foreigners who come to dominate your productive forces are slowing up your people's history, they're slowing up your culture. Knowing this comes to give us a good a background and understand the relationship between history, culture, and now ideology. When these foreigners come, they bring ideologies, a set of ideas, and they use history as a weapon to dictate the people's ideas. That's why during the time of slavery here in the United States of America, they used to tell our foreparents, you didn't have no history in Africa. In Africa, y'all were savages, you lived in trees, you ate each other, you didn't have no religion, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They do the same thing in Africa. In Africa, in countries, for, I'll give you a good, good example. France, Spain, Belgium, Italy, Portugal, all left Europe and went to Africa to colonize Africa. They even had tribal wars in between them. The Portuguese fighting against the British, against the Spanish to control this land. The French fighting against the British and the Portuguese to control this land. What they came to do was to control our ideology by distorting our history. They would come into this part and say, okay, from now on, this is not Africa, this is Spain. This is a province of Spain. This, this is not Africa either. This is a province of France. This is a province of, of, uh, of uh, England. And this is a problem of Portugal. And so here you will have to learn how to speak Spanish. You have to learn how to speak, what are you, French? <laughs> British. And you have to learn how to speak Portuguese. And then those few of you who go to school, you know what you will come to learn? You'll learn more about the rivers and the geography and the heroes of Spain, France, England, and Portugal than you will about the land that you live in. You will even come to regard yourself as being a French, a Belgian, an Italian, a Portuguese, a Spanish, or, or British. And then, matter of fact, you know how we all this time we try to do such a great job. We end up speaking the, the English language better than the English people themselves. <laughs> and then we're more English than them. And so then what happens when, these, when they come to take us from Africa, from our homeland, take us outside of Africa, they put us into these ships. My question I asked to some school children that I asked to you again tonight. If you take African people and you put them into a ship, what are these people? African people. All right, you take these same African people, little brother and little sister, and you take them over to China. When they get off of this boat, are these African people Chinese or are they still African? Y'all help me. they still African. Now, what if these Africans stay in China and they reproduce and then their children reproduce? What are the grandchildren? Are they Chinese or are they African? So then if you put these same Africans in a ship by force, 300 million. And you bring them to America. When they get off of these ships in America and sold like cattle, what are they? African. African people. And when these people reproduce and their children reproduce and they reproduce and they reproduce you and I, what are we? African. Do you really believe that? Yep. Yes. We are African people. Well then, how is it then when France and Germany and Spain and Italy and Portugal off to fight wars, why do we have Africans both born at home and abroad Waving the Portuguese flag and the French flag, higher than the French and the Portuguese themselves, saying, we're going to go get them. <laughs> it's an identity struggle. If we don't understand anything else, we must struggle with the question of identity. And then this question of identity, when we realize who we are, then we will know what to do. But I would be confused if I think that I'm a woman. And you would be confused if you think you are a man. And, any, and regardless of what you think about that, you go use the man's bathroom, still objectively, we're going to say, what is she? She's a woman. We do have some people like that, though, you know? <laughs> but it's a, a fundamental question, the question of identity. If you did not grow up in the conditions of racist, capitalist America, and you were up in outer space, and you were looking down, and you actually saw that there were people with gray hair, man, I mean, I have gone to some family reunions, and I have wanted to cry. When I have, we have gone to visit the cemeteries and you ask one of the elders to tell you about the family history, they can't go back any further than our great-grandfather. 
And they think that's where the history began. That's really a sad question. And so sometimes I even ask, I said, what are we? And they said, I don't know. And even some college students, one time we did a seminar when I was at Southern University in Louisiana, and we just simply titled the question, we said, this is a seminar on identity. Who are we, and what's our relationship to Africa? And so we said, well, let's go, let's go get the people from identity. And I know you might think it's crazy for adults to be doing a seminar on who are we, but let me just ask you, who are we? Give me the microphone. Who are we? Some say, uh, me, I'm a Negro. Others say, I'm colored. And others say, well, my great-grandmama was an Indian, so I'm Indian. You know what I'm saying? Anything but African. This is a serious struggle. They must have had some serious organizing for 500 years to convince a whole society of people, and not just Africans in America. When they took us from Africa, they took us to 62 countries outside of Africa. 62 countries outside of Africa. And even in these countries, you find some sisters, I'm sure you know about sister, some sisters and brothers born in the Bahamas who say they're West Indians, they ain't African. They West Indians. And then you'll find.